going to just give us an outline. Uh, the first thing that we're going to be discussing is early pregnancy bleeding. Uh, there's antipartum hemorrhage, postpartum hemorrhage, hypertensive disorders, shoulder dystocia, maternal resuscitation, and breach presentation. So this doesn't cover all the obstetric emergencies that are there, uh, but these are the main ones and the most common ones. And something important for us to remember as we are going through this presentation is that the main thing is to know how to initially manage these uh, these mothers and these women. Uh, the more complicated stuff, the surgical management and so on, usually is done once the patient has been resuscitated adequately. So it's very important and every healthcare worker should know how to resuscitate them. And during pregnancy, there are a few modifications when it comes to resuscitation and diagnosis is always very important. So starting with early pregnancy bleeding, we're going to look at a definition of terms, which is related to early pregnancy bleeding. So we have this unembryonic gestation, which is also known as a blighted ovum, where the ultrasound will show that there's a gestational sac. And the mean sac diameter is more than 25 millimeters, but there's no yolk sac seen or there's no embryo. So that's what people call a blighted ovum. And then there's a complete miscarriage. Now we use the word miscarriage instead of abortion, where there's complete passage of all the products of conception. And then there's early pregnancy loss, uh, where there's, it's not a viable intrauterine pregnancy within the first 12 weeks of gestation. We have an ectopic pregnancy, which is a pregnancy outside the uterine cavity, most commonly in the fallopian tube. Uh, embryonic demise is what we also call a missed miscarriage, in which you see that um, there's an embryo and the crown ramp length is more than seven millimeters, but there's no cardiac activity. So this is very important during ultrasounds, just to be able to define these things. Incomplete miscarriages when there's not complete passage of the, there are still products of conception when you examine the patient. Um, an intrauterine pregnancy of uncertain viability, like I said, there are certain cutoffs during ultrasound that help to tell us if it's more than, the gestational sac is more than 25 uh, millimeters and you don't see any yolk sac or embryo, then you can definitively say that that's, you know, a blighted ovum. Or if the crown ramp length is more than seven millimeters and there's no cardiac activity, then you can definitely say that's a missed miscarriage. But there are cases where the mean sac diameter is less than 25 millimeters or the crown ramp length is less than seven millimeters. And you can't really tell um, if this is, uh, you can't call it a non-viable pregnancy, for example. And in such patients, we send them for follow-up scans later on. Okay, so again, non-viable pregnancies is what we're talking about, just pregnancies that can't result in live births like ectopics. Then there's pregnancy of unknown location where again, someone has, has a positive pregnancy test, but there's no, on, when you do the scan, there's no ectopic and there's no intrauterine pregnancy. Um, recurrent uh, pregnancy loss, it depends where you are. So we either say two or three consecutive pregnancy losses. A spontaneous miscarriage is just a you know, failure of pregnancy before 20 weeks. A threatened miscarriage is when um, there's bleeding before 20 weeks, uh, there's no cardiac activity, but there's a closed cervix and a viable pregnancy. I think we all know that. So with those definitions, we have an algorithm here that can just help us to, to understand when a patient comes in, um, and it's always safe. And I think we have those things. We have the algorithms and protocols. It's very easy to refer to. You don't need to memorize everything. So if there's bleeding uh, at less than 12 weeks gestation, so you take a very good history, you do a, your physical examination. Of course, your physical examination involves just a general examination. You check the abdomen as well. And you also do a speculum exam just to see about the products of conception. So if there are any peritoneal signs or there are signs of hemodynamic instability, that's a patient that you resuscitate. So we must always remember resuscitation is the first thing to do. And with resuscitation, as we were even told before, it's your ABCs. So you don't rush to just go to C. It's airway, it's breathing. So in ensuring that the airway is protected, you're making sure that you're giving oxygen if need be and circulation, uh, which would now be putting two large bore IV cannulas, getting blood for CBC, grouping and cross-matching, giving them uh, IV fluids if need be. And at that point, you've called for help. 
and you've also called the OB who's around the anesthetist if your facility has a theater because we're considering immediate surgical intervention. And if not, you resuscitate the patient enough for you to transfer to another facility. Um, so if you find there's an obstetric cause, of course, of, of this bleeding, which could be anything, it could be a polyp, or if you look inside, it's cervicitis because of infection and so on, you diagnose and treat. And that obviously will not be an emergency at that point. If you see products of conception uh, during your examination, that is very likely an complete miscarriage. And in most cases, it's not enough just to look and you see all the of products uh, when you do your speculum examination or you're seeing products of conception coming out. It's your duty as a healthcare worker to remove what you can see, not what you can't see, but to remove what you can see. And in many cases, that really helps uh, in terms of uh, get, uh, achieving hemostasis as you've done your resuscitation. So that's helpful. If the patient is stable, there are no products of conception uh, seen, and there are no other causes of bleeding that have been identified, then you can do your scan and you also obtain a beta HCG level if you have access to that. So of course, when we're doing the scan, we're just trying to see, is it an uh, intrauterine pregnancy? Is it not an intrauterine pregnancy? Is it viable? Is it not viable? But in such cases, by the time you're doing all of this, you should have first stabilized your your patient, that's the most important thing, okay? So um, in things like incomplete miscarriage or a missed miscarriage, we encounter these cases a lot in wherever our outpatient clinics, in hospital, everywhere. Uh, and usually I see that there's a lot of confusion in regards to how much misoprostol should you give uh, if you're dealing with a missed miscarriage or or an incomplete miscarriage, uh, at how many weeks do you give, and so on and so forth. So this is very helpful. FIGO developed some guidelines, which they always update, and it's very easy to download that, to download it on your phone or wherever, and refer to it. Because again, many of these things, you don't need to memorize dosages and so on. It's just a simple thing of downloading, having a look, and then treating appropriately, yeah? So I just thought I would show that it looks like that, but anyone can download it. It's FIGO, FIGO guidelines. So moving on, we talk about antipartum hemorrhage. So this is hemorrhage that occurs after fetal viability. And this is a major cause of death in both the mother and the fetus. So again, I will always, I'll keep repeating this resuscitation, resuscitation, resuscitation. You do your ABCs. At C, you have to have two large bore IVs. You take blood, you, you give IV fluids as appropriate. You set up your monitors because of course you're going to check um, how the oxygen levels and everything else. You give oxygen as required. And then if, if you have access to ultrasound machines, hopefully, then you can do a fast ultrasound that is just checking for you know, free fluid in the pelvis. And at the same time, because the fetus is, is, is supposed to be viable, you should check the fetal heart rate. It's very important to remember, do not do any pelvic exam for these patients. Because if they have things like placenta previa and you're doing a pelvic exam, you will aggravate and even worsen the bleeding. And call OB or trans, I mean, plan to transfer to a facility that has an OBGYN or someone that can manage uh, some of these cases surgically. So we look at the differentials of what we call antipartum hemorrhage. Uh, of course, there are non-obstetric causes, there are obstetric causes, and there are non-vaginal causes. So the non-obstetric and the non-vaginal causes, usually those ones are usually very, um, they are not usually emergent at that point. So cervicitis, vaginitis, you just, I mean, you examine your patient and you'll be able to see and decide. And then when you look at the obstetric causes, you look if there are significant bleeding, yes or no. So if it is yes, then now you can, uh, you can now have your differentials. And the differentials usually, the main four ones that are there, there's placenta previa, there's abruptio placenta, there's uh, vasa previa, and there's uterine rupture. So I'll just briefly discuss these one by one. If it's not significant bleeding, of course, you think about other things like blood issue. So placenta previa, we look at the risks of placenta previa. So placenta previa just means that the placenta is overlying the cervical os, basically. 
Uh, and the risk factors for that is if someone has had previous years or they've had previous instrumentation of the, of the uterus. So for example, dilatation and curettage, if they have multiple gestation or even smoking is a factor. And when you examine these patients and you diagnose them, usually the bleeding is painless. So it's not painful bleeding. When you examine the abdomen, uh, it's usually soft, not tender. And in this case, a pelvic ultrasound is fine because it will be able to diagnose the placenta previa properly. So management, again, like we have said, is resuscitation and you call OB or call someone who's experienced with surgery who can be able to make a decision. Do they want to remove the baby immediately or do they want to observe and see? It just depends on the degree of bleeding and so on. But it's also good to be able to diagnose that. So when we look at passa previa, it's just basically when the fetal vessels are very close to the cervical os, or they're overlying the cervical os, which can happen. So it just depends on how the cord insertion is, uh, if they've had if they have placenta previa or if they have a bilobed placenta. So with diagnosis like that, you find that there's fetal distress, definitely. Uh, you might find hemorrhage if you rupture the, the baby's membranes. And this, it causes, it's a 50 to 100% cause of fetal mortality, just because the fetal blood volume is very little. So any blood loss is significant for the fetus. So in such cases, it's very important to transfer or be in a facility where you have access to people who are well conversed with the neonatal resuscitation, not only just being an emergency yes, but to be able to do neonatal resuscitation. Then we have placental abruption, uh, which is when the it's just premature separation of the placenta from the uterine wall. Uh, the risks are hypertensive disorders, which we are going to discuss. There's smoking or cocaine use. There's trauma. Um, there's also the premature rupture of membranes. And there are other causes, uterine overdistension, but those are the main ones. Uh, diagnosis is it's usually, again, this is painful bleeding. When you uh, examine the abdomen, you will find that there is pain. There can be contractions, there's tenderness. And with this, uh, pelvic ultrasounds are not usually the best because they're not always diagnostic of uh, placental abruption. So if you do a pelvic ultrasound and you find that there's no abruption that has been seen, uh, you do not automatically assume. So it's mainly a clinical diagnosis, to be honest. Uh, you'd also find fetal distress. You'd also find signs of hypovolemia in the mother just because the bleeding can be concealed. So it's not necessary that the vaginal bleeding matches the bleeding that has already been going on. So in such things, again, management, resuscitation is important. Call OB because those are usually emergencies. You want to do an emergency CS. And these mothers are at an increased risk of DIC. So it's important to just do a coagulation profile at the same time. So we have uterine rupture uh, where we see that uh, this is just rupture of the uterus basically. And the risks are usually if uh, they've had a previous cesarean section of this uterine over distension or this trauma. So uh, in such cases, again, very big emergency, it is painful. So you'll find when you examine the, the mother, there are palpable fetal uh, parts. Uh, you'll find a woody hard abdomen as well. Uh, and then of course, signs and symptoms of hypovolemia. So in such cases, again, resuscitation, but she has to go to surgery because you have to do an emergency CS and also repair of the, of the uterus at the same time. So those were the four causes of APH, the main ones. So we move on to postpartum hemorrhage where the blood loss is, uh, if it's more than 500 mils after vaginal delivery or more than one liter after cesarean section, that, those are the definitions. And we always look at, I'm sure we all know the four T's uh, that are implicated in this postpartum hemorrhage. And the most common is atony. So if there's loss of uterine tone, this is the most common, it occurs in 70% of the cases. Then there's trauma, and then there's tissue, retention of tissue, and then there's coagulation disorders or thrombin disorders. So that's how we remember the four T's. So looking at uterine atony, which like we said, is the most common one. A lady has been delivered. You've done the third stage of labor the way you're supposed to do it. The first thing you do is call for help. 
have your team come in because all these things that we're doing have has to happen simultaneously. So it's not a step-by-step -step thing that you do. So you begin with a bimanual uterine massage, which we'll see in the next pictures. So you someone begins doing the bimanual uterine massage to try help the uterus contract. The bladder is emptied. Again, resuscitation as we have discussed, ABCs, large bore IVs, take blood, um, Get, start giving fluids. And then we have our uterotonics, which is uh, oxytocin, misoprostol, carboprost, and, and, and agometrin. So all of them, again, these are not things that need to be memorized per se. It would always be helpful in your facility to just have a poster that has this information of how much to give and dosages and so on. Um, there's a trial that has, was done before that was just looking at the role of tranexamic acid, uh, and it showed that it, it helped with a 20 to 30 uh, percent decrease in mortality. So you can consider giving tranexamic acid one gram IV at that time. So that's just an illustration showing a bimanual uterine massage, how it's done. One hand is out, one hand is the fist is in, and you're massaging, you're literally compressing the uterus because it's atony, so it has failed to contract well. Then and you do trauma. So, like we said, yes, there's atony, but at the same time, you are all of these things are happening simultaneously. So if there's any perineal tear or any cervical tear that needs to be repaired, it is repaired at that time. Um, if there's uterine inversion in which the uterus has prolapse from where it's supposed to be, then now you do manual reduction of, of the uterus, which we'll show you in the next illustration, where you gently grasp the fundus and return it back in very gently. Because again, the, all of this is very friable, soft. It can be easily injured. So tissue is just manual evacuation of that tissue, which you can do at the same time that you're checking even for tears. You, you get in completely and you manually remove if there's any retained placenta or membranes. Uh, if the patient is in significant pain, you can take them for examination under anesthesia if it's something that can be done quickly. And also another way to prevent just parts being left behind is to make sure that once you have delivered, the placenta has been examined sufficiently. Okay. So thrombin, again, I mean, the percentage is very low. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. From the history, you'll be able to tell, do they have any coagulopathies? You also investigate for them. And the only way to manage them is to give the appropriate blood components, and then you increase the intravascular volume. So postpartum hemorrhage can reach where it's a major obstetric hemorrhage. So blood loss is more than one liter, or the patient is just continuing to bleed and they're now in clinical shock. Postpartum hemorrhage can progress very, very quickly. So in such cases, we've already called for help. You have involved the blood bank already, uh, and then you're now doing your resuscitation. You're giving them the fluids. You're giving them either O negative blood or group specific blood. You're keeping the patient warm. You have other blood products ready and you also have theater ready because the way it progresses very quickly, there will be a need for the patient to be rushed to theater almost immediately. So it's not something that you wait for, you go step by step, it really progresses quickly. So all these methods have been there, you've done everything, you've done it very quickly, you've tried to correct what needs to be corrected, but nothing is changing, these methods have failed. Um, we acknowledge that not every facility is going to have um, you know, theater is not going to have maybe interventional radiology and so on. But there's something that every facility can have, even a dispensary, even an ambulance, uh, and that's the intrauterine balloon tamponade. So basically, it's a, it's a balloon tamponade that you insert within the uterus, and then you inflate a balloon that causes uterine compression and helps to stop the bleeding, either temporarily or it can be a you know, a permanent solution. Uh, and that's what we're going to discuss. The other things of surgery, that one is, is fine and it's known and they can be tried because you've already resuscitated the, the patient at that point. So with the balloon tamponade, this is just an example. If you look at picture B, which just shows us an example, that's like a Bakri balloon that just causes pressure on the uterine walls. Uh, but if you don't have access to these, um, devices, you can use a condom catheter, uh, what, just using a condom and a catheter. So basically what you're looking at here is the condom, 
is a one way foley catheter, is a syringe, and then just a suture to tie the, the condom around the, 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 the catheter. So that's also very, very effective and it's not expensive and it's very easily stored anywhere. Okay. So next we'll just look at a video showing us that. Grace is a midwife at a local health center. Every day she helps deliver babies. Today at the health center, Mary is in labor. Grace knows that some bleeding after a baby is born is normal. However, if a mother's uterus does not contract after the birth of the placenta, I'm sorry. the bleeding can become severe. This is a life-threatening emergence called postpartum hemorrhage. Uterine balloon tamponade, or UBT, is a medical procedure which helps to stop severe bleeding and can save lives. Grace has a ready-made UBT kit which has a Foley catheter with a one-way valve inserted in the end, a large syringe, two pieces of string, and a condom. She also has gloves and clean water. She stores the UBT kit and equipment in a clean, accessible place. Grace helps to deliver Mary's baby, then gives drugs to help the uterus to contract. Grace gives 600 micrograms of misoprostol or an injection of 10 units of oxytocin. But once the placenta is delivered, Mary begins to bleed. Grace performs uterine massage to slow the bleeding and then checks that the placenta is whole and that no tissue has been left inside the uterus. She makes sure the bleeding is not coming from a tear in the cervix or vagina. But Mary is still bleeding heavily. So Grace empties the bladder and gives a treatment dose of misoprostol or oxytocin to help contract the uterus. Grace also continues to massage the uterus. Mary continues to bleed heavily. The normal methods to stop the bleeding have failed. Grace knows that Mary is losing too much blood and this is now an emergence. Grace must act quickly. She uses the UBT kit. Grace makes sure she has enough light so that she can see clearly. She washes her hands with clean running water and soap. Puts on clean gloves and opens and assembles the UBT kit. She inserts the catheter halfway into the condom balloon. She carefully wraps both pieces of string around the base of the balloon, tying it tightly to the catheter, making sure it will not come loose. She draws clean water into the syringe and attaches it to the catheter at the opening used to fill the smaller Foley balloon, which is at the top of the catheter. She inserts the UBT into the uterus. She pushes 15 ml of clean water through the catheter into the Foley balloon. Grace then draws water into the syringe and attaches it to the one-way valve into the catheter. She pushes water into the main condom balloon inside the uterus. As the balloon fills with water, it inflates. She repeats this action using as much water as necessary to stop the bleeding. Each time Grace removes the syringe to refill the balloon, the one-way valve in the carpet prevents the from coming back out. If a UBT kit with a one-way valve in the catheter is not available, a clamp can be used on the catheter to prevent the water from coming out while refilling the syringe. 
As grease continues to add water, the balloon inflates and puts pressure on the inside of the uterus, which is where the bleeding is coming from. This pressure stops the bleeding. Grace then gives Mary a single dose of antibiotics to reduce the risk of infection. If the bleeding does not stop, Grace should check the UBT is correctly positioned and that there is no other source of bleeding. The balloon must remain inside the uterus for 6 to 24 hours. Grace regularly checks to be sure that Mary is no longer bleeding and that her uterus has contracted. She also regularly checks Mary's vital signs, such as heart rate and blood pressure, while the balloon is in place. In order to remove the UBT, Grace attaches the syringe to the catheter and slowly draws out one or two syringes full of water to lower the pressure without taking out the balloon. She watches for 60 minutes. If the bleeding starts again, Grace must refill the balloon with clean water and arrange for Mary to go to the nearest hospital. If there is no bleeding, Grace uses the syringe to remove all the water from the balloon deflates the small foley balloon and then removes the UBT from the uterus completely. In most cases, the UBT will successfully stop the bleeding. Mary and her baby are safe and healthy. So we move on to hypertensive disorders uh, in pregnancy. So there are four types of hypertensive disorders that have been identified. Uh, we have chronic hypertension, which is basically hypertension before 20 weeks of, of pregnancy. Usually a patient has been managed for it before, or even maybe diagnosed earlier, much earlier in pregnancy, but that's usually chronic hypertension. Then we have gestational hypertension, which occurs after 20 weeks of, of pregnancy. And then we have preeclampsia, which is gestational hypertension plus proteinuria, or if there's no proteinuria, then there are signs of severity, which we can find, uh, which I'm going to define just now. And then we have uh, eclampsia, which is uh, loss of consciousness or seizures in the setting of someone who has gestational hypertension. So just a quick look at the criteria for the diagnosis of preeclampsia. Uh, it's usually systolic blood pressure of more than or equal to 140 millimeters of, of mercury or the diastolic blood pressure of more than 90 millimeters of mercury. And this is usually on two occasions, which are at least four hours apart. And like I said, it has to happen at 20 weeks of gestation uh, and this protein urea. So if you, have, if you don't have the quantitative measurements that have been now shown here, so for example, proteinuria in a 24-hour urine specimen of more than 0.3 grams or uh, urine albumin creatinine ratio of more than 25, a dipstick is still fine, but still on two occasions of proteinuria plus one. So in patients who have new onset hypertension, but they don't have proteinuria, and they have some of these symptoms. So the platelet count is less than 100, uh, 100,000. The serum creatinine is more than 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, the liver transaminases, ALT, AST, at least twice the normal concentrations. If there's a pulmonary edema or the cerebral or visual symptoms, that can still be defined as preeclampsia. So when we look at preeclampsia, and what I've just mentioned are the severe symptoms of preeclampsia, so that's what defines it as severe. 
Uh, but if you, they have mild preeclampsia, so the pressure is above 140 over 90, uh, and they have proteinuria, it can be considered mild preeclampsia. And basically with such patients, you, in most patients, the advice is to admit them, but uh, it, you know, it's not always possible for all patients to do such a thing. So you look at them, the treatment is usually very, it can be individualized. So you do maternal evaluation, you do the fetal evaluation, you look at how what is the gestation of this fetus. If the fetus is more than 37 weeks and the mother has symptoms of severity and she has a favorable uh, cervix or the fetus also is showing signs of distress, then you plan for delivery. You give them magnesium sulfate, which helps to prevent the seizures. And then you plan for their delivery because after 37 weeks, they're considered viable. And if we remember preeclampsia, eclampsia, these are all diseases of progression. So until delivery is done, delivery is the definitive management. But um, we, I mean, before then, it's sort of just sort of trying to help manage the symptoms before uh, things go out of hand and before you can actually deliver the child. So always keep that in mind with preeclampsia, that even if you've controlled uh, the blood pressure, even if the mother seems a bit stable, it's something that she needs to keep being followed up. And the only definitive treatment is going to be uh, delivery of this, of the baby to help both mother and baby. So those are the things that we keep in mind. If she's less than 37 weeks, but they still have symptoms of severity, so the hypertension is still there, even if you've given antihypertensives, they still persist in proteinuria, the lab tests are abnormal, there's abnormal fetal growth, or the patient is unreliable, which just means, I mean, not in a bad way, but if the patient lives very far from a health facility and they won't be able to be checked up probably twice a week, then you can keep them in hospital uh, until probably they deliver. So uh, that's just in a nutshell. So when we look at severe preeclampsia, and like we said, where there's thrombocytopenia, um, there's elevated liver function tests, you find there's pulmonary edema, or they have you know, cerebral, um, cerebral symptoms and so on. This is a patient that you admit, you have to evaluate the mother and the fetus, you give magnesium sulfate, it's very important for prevention uh, of, of eclampsia of seizures, you give antihypertensives. It's very important. Um, if the systolic is more than 160, if the diastolic is more than 100 or 110. And um, it's, I mean, I'm just repeating everything that I've said before, but if a mother comes like that, she is in distress or the fetus is in distress or she's more than 34 weeks or she's already gone into labor, give man magnesium sulfate, very important and plan for delivery. If she's, um, Below 34 weeks, she can still uh, benefit from receiving two doses of steroids just to help with the fetal lung maturation, get magnesium sulfate, deliver. So the main things that you have to remember to do when someone comes in with severe preeclampsia is that apart from resuscitation and your ABCs and so on, is that you uh, maturation of the fetal lungs preventing seizures, controlling the blood pressure with antihypertensives, and then thinking about delivery on an individual basis, yeah? Uh, so if it's before 23 weeks, it becomes a bit tricky, especially if the mother begins to now be completely compromised. Um, when it's very severe, we consider termination of pregnancy. But again, that is uh, something that needs to be deliberated and explained properly. Um, basically, and that's, that's, uh, that's an overview of how to treat severe preeclampsia. So looking at the regimens of giving magnesium sulfate for the management of severe preeclampsia and eclampsia, uh, there are two regimens. There's the Pritchard, which is intramuscular mainly, and there's the Zuspan method. So with the Pritchard, you give four grams IV over three to five minutes. And then you, after that, you give 10 grams deep IM, so five grams in each buttock, and then to maintain you give five grams IM four hourly in alternate buttocks. With the Zuspan, you give four grams IV of uh, magnesium sulfate over 15 to 20 minutes, followed by a one to two gram per hour IV infusion for 24 hours. The thing about magnesium is magnesium toxicity is very possible. 
So in all the time that you're giving this patient magnesium sulfate, you have to be on the lookout for signs of toxicity, which is now altered mental status, or if they have signs of respiratory depression, or their deep, I mean, loss of deep tendon reflexes, and also hyperreflexia as well, and oliguria. So if the urine output is less than 0 0.5 mils per kg per hour, those are all signs of magnesium toxicity. And there's an antidote for that. So if, if that occurs, there's signs of magnesium toxicity or you're in a facility that can quickly do check the magnesium uh, levels and you find that there is toxicity, then you can give uh, calcium gluconate, uh, 10 mils of 10% of calcium gluconate. That would be the antidote for magnesium uh, toxicity. So eclampsia, like I said, patients is unconscious or they have seizures in the setting of gestational hypertension or preeclampsia. Again, we never forget our ABCs. So protect the mother's airway, breathing, give oxygen as necessary 100% and then now continue from there. Always call for help, always have an activate a multidisciplinary team, control the hypertension at that time. So you can give labetalol or hydralazine. Labetalol has just been seen to have less adverse effects than hydralazine, but it really depends on what is available in your facility. And then once you are stabilized, then now you can decide on delivery because for that one, the finished management is delivery. And it would always be helpful to do delivery in a place that has access to a critical care unit where you can now uh, admit the mother there afterwards. Uh, shoulder dystocia is when the mother has delivered, so there's delivery of the fetus's head, but the shoulders have are impacted or they're stuck behind. And such cases, I mean, the risk factors is if it's a if it's a big baby in a setting of a mother who maybe has gestation gestational diabetes and so on. So the dangers of this shoulder dystocia is that the umbilical cord can be entrapped. Uh, the child's chest definitely is not going to expand properly at the time. Fetal hypoxia is a very big. Uh, is a very big factor because of delays in that delivery. And as you're trying to deliver, not only can you, the fetus get brachial plexus damage, but there can also be fractures as well, uh, which is really dangerous for this child. And this is for the fetal dangers, but when fetal dangers, they can have very deep and severe perineal tears, so third degree, fourth degree tears, and they're also at risk of getting postpartum hemorrhage. So shoulder dystocia is also a major obstetric emergency that needs to be recognized immediately. And it's just very important that all personnel who are working in that facility uh, are well versed with the maneuvers and, and, and how to, to recognize and how to deal with shoulder dystocia. So there's a mnemonic that can help us again helpful just having these documents uh, in our facilities is helpful. It's called the helper mnemonic. So H is calling for help. In everything, we always call for help. E, you evaluate for an episiotomy. Uh, L is the leg, so it's maneuver. There's a video that I'm going to show next that should help us with that, just to show us. So basically, you flex the hips and you also abduct the, the legs, which now increases the space for the pelvis. The sacrum, uh, the sacral bone goes down and there's more space for the pelvis and for the baby to come out. At the same time, you're putting external pressure, which is suprapubic pressure. The other E stands for enter their rotational maneuvers, which we are, you're going to see in that. And then there's removal of the posterior arm. And if all of that fails to work, you roll the patient to her hands and knees and you repeat the same maneuvers. So again, all of this is not something that take, each of them takes one minute, one minute. It's, I mean, the, the space between all of them is about you know, 10 to 20 seconds uh, that is allowed in between that time. And then, of course, if all of this fails, then now we consider surgical methods. So symphysiotomy, uh, cleidotomy, or we take them in for a cesarean, I mean, for an abdominal removal of the baby, which is like a cesarean section while we return the head. Uh, but those are very drastic. Those are the very drastic measures. These have been shown to actually help in majority of the shoulder dystocia cases. So this is just another a small picture that's showing us Macrobert's maneuver, it's showing us the, the suprapubic pressure, pressure and then the left shoulder. So that all of these maneuvers and the suprapubic pressure are also just designed to sort of dislodge the fetal shoulder in order for it to, to come out.
Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Okay, little pushes. And breathe. That's it. Okay, and the baby's head's out. Okay, so the baby's head's out. Right, I'm just having a little trouble um, delivering the baby's shoulders. I'm just going to go call for help, okay? that can help with these skills. Skill sessions are, are very important. It's very hard to illustrate by a video, maybe a discussion and so on. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what we can organize. There are also uh, sessions that occur twice a year. People can, anyone can sign up for uh, and get the necessary skills from there, which is also good. So that's shoulder dystocia. So we move on to maternal resuscitation, um, which is like just how we handle adult cardiac arrest. Just that there, there's some modifications that are done, some obstetric and some maternal modifications that can be done uh, in order to now just perform a better uh, resuscitation. 
So this is because of the many unique aspects of the maternal physiology, which now changes the whole conduct. And another thing to remember is that there's also a baby. So an emergency hysterotomy is usually recommended four minutes after maternal cardiac arrest. This is yes, to save the life of the baby, but also to uh, improve the mother's chances during maternal resuscitation because the, the uterus and the blood flow and everything also uh, gets in the way or sort of impedes the whole uh, cardiac resuscitation for the mother. So this is an algorithm that is found in the emergency algorithms that uh, emergency medicine Kenya has, has provided for us. So of course, it's all the very same thing. You, as a first responder, you must activate the maternal cardiac arrest team or the cardiac arrest team. The patient should be supine. You start chest compressions as per the algorithm. But in this case, you place the hand slightly higher on the sternum than usual. Uh, when we look at maternal interventions, you use the very same algorithm. So you do not delay defibrillation. You give the typical ACLS drugs and the doses. We do give early oxygenation, 100% of oxygen, uh, and then you monitor waveform, capnography, and so on. The modifications would be starting the IV above the, the, the diaphragm, assess for hypovolemia. Like we said before, pregnant women, uh, it will be a while before you see the the signs of hypovolemia, there is a lot of blood loss that can occur before you see signs and symptoms of hypovolemia. So it's important to assess and give a fluid bolus when required. Always anticipate a difficult airway because there will be laryngeal edema, especially towards the end of the pregnancy. So it's always to be it's always important to be aware and if possible, have an experienced provider who can now do the advanced airway placement. If this is a patient who had preeclampsia or eclampsia before and they were getting IV magnesium, think about ma uh, magnesium toxicity in such a case. And again, stop the magnesium immediately and then you give calcium chloride or you give calcium uh, gluconate. And then now you just continue all other resuscitative interventions. When we're looking at the obstetric interventions for a patient with an obviously gravid uterus, so that's a uterus where the it is more than 20 weeks gestation, it's above the umbilicus or at the umbilicus. It's very important to relieve the autocable compression by performing what we call a left uterine displacement, which you'll see in a picture in the next slide. So that's important to relieve autocable uh, compression. And then if there were any fetal monitors and so on, remove them because that will just impede the resuscitation process. So the other thing that is important when you are calling for your help and the maternal cardiac arrest team uh, have arrived, it's important to either have an obstetrician gynecologist available or someone who is able to do a hysterotomy. So if there's no a ROSC after four minutes of this resuscitative methods, you must con consider performing an immediate emergency CS. So delivery is to happen within five minutes of onset of resuscitative uh, efforts. Uh, and that's very, very important that you do it then. Then there's no need to think about anesthesia and so on. This is both for the life of the baby, but also for the benefit of the mother. And uh, like we have been told before, when you these adult cardiac arrest, the things that you have to consider the H's and T's. And in pregnancy, we also look at these other contributing factors. So it's called biochops, as you can see there, biochops. So bleeding is a possibility, especially if they've just delivered postpartum hemorrhage and so on, all of that is part of it. Embolism, anesthetic complications, if they're in theater or they got an epidural, uterine atony, as we had discussed before, cardiac disease, hypertensive disorders, other is the five H's and T's, uh, placenta, brachial previa, and sepsis. So you have to, you should also keep these in mind when you're dealing uh, with, with these mothers and magnesium toxicity if they were already on uh, magnesium infusion. So this is just something showing the more than 20 weeks gestational size of uterus. When you can see that, you can have a one-handed uh, technique which is now left uterine displacement, or you can use a two-handed technique. So you have a specific person who's doing that. It's not the person doing compressions or the person doing anything else when you're doing the uh, when you're doing CPR or you're running the code. This is someone who's specifically uh, displacing the uterus. Or alternatively, you can just place them 
uh, laterally put a wedge under their pelvis and their thorax just to uh, sort of tilt them. So that's important when you're considering maternal resuscitation. Again, it's important. Algorithms are very important to familiarize ourselves with them. Um, we can't always memorize everything altogether, but it's important if we can make small posters and so on, so that there are things that we can refer to. So then the last emergency uh, in the list of the many emergencies is a breach delivery, if you ever encounter it. So I'm just going to play a video that shows all the steps that one should go through. So today we're going to talk about the, some of the maneuvers required to deliver a breach vaginally. Now, well, even though cesarean section is much more common for breach, it still is uh, an issue and we need to train to deliver breach vaginally wherever we can, particularly when the woman arrives at, you know, in advanced labour. So the first thing is, as the mother's pushing, just really keep your hands off the breach. Uh, don't try and pull. The more you pull, the more likely you are to get a nuclear arm. This, this mother's really doing well. So you can see that often the legs will deliver spontaneously. However, if they don't, then it's worth just flexing the knees and bringing the legs down. Again, with this side, flex them, bring it down. Now then, put your fingers in the groins of the baby with your thumbs over the sacrum. It's really important then just to let the baby come down till you see the scapula, you can see it just there. Rotate the right baby round in love sets maneuver. Then with the same finger as the same side as the shoulder, put your finger over the baby's shoulder into the anti-cubital fossa and flex the arm down. Now I recommend then roll it around again, use the other side's finger to get into the anti-cubital fossa and again flex the arm down over the chest. Then with the pushing from the mother, pushing down, you can see that the nape of the neck coming down. I would then use Morisot Smelly Vite for this. So for Morisot Smelly Vite it's important to rest the baby's abdomen on your forearm, on the lower hand press on the cheeks of the baby and the upper hand press on the occiput to maintain flexion. So keep the chin on the baby's chest so the head doesn't become overextended. As the mother's pushing then what I would do is stand up and maintain the flexion and deliver the baby in a J shape like that. Sometimes the uh, head doesn't descend enough for us to do more so smelly bite and it's important to have a think about manoeuvres that can help descent so that we can deliver the baby and particularly the after coming head. So one of the things to do is superior pressure to maintain flexion of the baby's head. So Cathy if we can do that and that in of itself can be a useful manoeuvre. However sometimes that doesn't work either and it's important then to think about what is available for next steps. So Cathy, if you can get your assistant to hold the baby up whilst you place the blades. So it's a standard application of Keelan's. Uh, just pop them in laterally, just like you normally would. Let the blades come down a bit. And again on this side, again laterally. Just let the weight of the blades come in like that. Just let the blades settle in, join them together. And Cathy, I'm going to take the baby now, that's great. Let's rest the baby down. Then just like Morisot Smelly Vite, put your hand to flex the baby's head at the occiput and just stand up like a J shape to help to facilitate the birth of the after coming head. Yeah, that is breach delivery. I think just one thing to remember that's very important is when you're supporting the baby at the hips, it's important not to wrap your hands around the fetus because of course the, the fetus is small so that also can cause umbilical cord compression and you wouldn't want to do that when you're doing your delivery so it's just important to remember to just hold at the anterior superior il iliac spines and generally with breach it's a hands off it's a hands off procedure um when when it's occurring um yes but the video says it all not all facilities have access or personnel who are well conversant with forceps so we wouldn't move to that immediately. Um, the other options are if the after coming head is not um, is not being delivered easily, then you now start considering other things, bilateral episiotomy, symphysiotomy, or now you it becomes more complicated and you think about performing some sort of uh, cesarean section in some way. 
Uh, so that's bridge delivery and just an overview. But the, the most important thing with all of these obstetric emergencies and so on is remember to resuscitate, not just to think about the diagnosis and, and how we are going to treat them and put them in theater. Resuscitation really goes a long way in terms of stabilizing these mothers and just being able to diagnose that this is this is what's going on with them. And uh, and skills are important. So if you have access and there's a lot of access, uh, especially with the Emergency Medicine Kenya Foundation, then um, just enroll for all of these uh, courses. It's very helpful.